Yeah, you got to like the intro there. Welcome, everybody, live. It's Friday night. Another wonderful Care Talks coming your way. I'm John Shenholsa, co-founder of Care Talks, here with Honesty Lilla, the other co-founder. We got a marvelous lineup for y'all tonight. And I know this might be the last night we're all COVID, you know, tucked in and everything. Looks like a lot of places are going to be open up, and we may be able to do a live one in person next time around. We're still kind of thinking about that, but... Without further ado, Honesty, take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Honesty Liller, co-founder of Care Talks and a woman in long-term recovery yesterday, 14 years. Woo! Recovery rocks. Um, and we have a great show tonight. Yes, hopefully we will be able to get in person soon. Uh, we definitely miss the in-person events. But I honestly, the other end, I love these virtual ones because we're able to get so many different people from all over. So our first speaker, I've been following her for years. She came to McShen, um, I guess it was five or six years ago to one of our events. And so I follow her all on social media, all of her roller derbying and everything that she's doing. And um, it's a close. So the sobriety collective clothes um, that she does like sober clothes and jewelry and stuff. Um, and also just an advocate for um, a woman advocate for, you know, the addiction and recovery movement. So I will give our first speaker, Laura Silverman. Hi everyone. <laughs> oh. <Hair flip. laughs> it is so nice to be here tonight with you all and thank you for that wonderful intro honesty once again my name is laura silverman i am a woman in long-term recovery which for me means i haven't had a drink or drug since july 14th 2007 but i also call myself a booze-free babe and it may be a little controversial but i don't call myself an alcoholic and that's just not part of my narrative. And, and that's one of the things that I wanna to talk tonight about since this is all about finding a solution. And so Johan Hari, maybe some of us remember his name, I think about five or six years ago, said the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And when I first heard that, I had a lot of feelings come up. Um, but when I really thought about it, he was he was right um in in addiction in our disorders um isolation is something that really kind of keeps people in the suffering and connecting is is what gets us out of that and so connection for me it's it's a couple of things one is connection to the internet hopefully you have a good connection to the internet and the other is connection to other human beings sometimes on the internet and sometimes in in real life in person and i don't i don't want to say that the internet isn't real life because it is it's just a different different facet of it um so connection and ownership over our stories over my story um you know honesty mentioned that that i came to mcshin uh, about five or six years ago and i remember i had just started a blog called the sobriety collective which for me was uh, a way to connect with other people and um to really focus on alternative modes of recovery alternative types of sobriety and I remember that this conference was called multiple pathways of recovery and I hadn't heard that many people talk about multiple pathways um, there's a, a traditional pathway that works for many millions of people and I have the utmost respect for it it's part of my past and my story but it didn't work for me after a while and I felt very alone thinking that I might be the only person who, who was going through feelings of alienation or isolation. And so that's one of the reasons why I started my blog because I wanted to connect with other people and see if there was anyone else out there with a story like mine. And when I went to McShin, I really felt seen and heard. And here were people talking about multiple ways of getting sober, finding treatment. And there are an infinite number of seats at the table and an infinite number of ways to get there. And that's something that I, I truly believe is, is so valuable. And so another thing that, that I wanted to talk about in sort of addressing a solution is that I, th I think it was around the same time that, that I was at McShin where the term substance use disorder was uh, more normalized and put into the DSM. And for so long it had been addiction 
and alcoholism. And I think that having people be able to see where they are along a spectrum, whether they had mild substance use disorder or medium or severe, I think that actually adds more to one's own personal solution. So I've just, I've always been an advocate for different ways to get to the same table. It's just a really long, long table. And, uh, and like, like honesty, I am also in club 2007. So on July 14th, I will celebrate 14 years. It'll be my golden birthday, 14 on the 14th. And I'm just, I'm so grateful to be where I am now. Um, but it wasn't always easy. And I think the thing that, that got me to where I am now is, is having the ability to connect authentically with other human beings, to be radically accepting of where everyone is, meet people where they're at in their stories. And so I've sort of transitioned the way that I, that I think about my recovery. Um, I will always be in recovery, but for me, it's more about my mental health and my day to day with my mental health. And it's also about discovering. So maybe not even recovery, but discovery, discovering what does work for you, um, choosing a vast recovery menu. Maybe it's 12 steps and smart and therapy and roller derby and um, reading lots of books, being in nature. There's, there's really no one to say that one thing works over another if it works for you. It works for you. And so I really think and, and recommend this to so many people that they find a multitude of things. No, you don't have to pigeon yourself into, into one box. You can have lots of different tools in your toolbox that work for you. And I have I've really found that with with time being sober, with aging in my 30s, um, gosh, if I just turned 38 last week, but I don't look it, don't sound it, and don't act like it, <laughs> because not drinking for almost 14 years will do that, and getting lots of sleep and staying hydrated. Um, but really, it's just it's just about owning our stories, owning where we are, how far we've come, and we can't do that in a vacuum. So I do that connecting with other people. And um, another thing Honesty mentioned that has been so important to me, and I referenced it in the very beginning of my chat, which, which may be ending soon, I'm not sure, I don't see, I do see a time warning now, <laughs> um, is, is connection to the internet. And I have found such a vast network of people all over the world who, whether they consider themselves gray area drinkers and just want to stop drinking because it's just not serving them anymore, it might be dry January, or they may truly be suffering from a substance use disorder and need treatment, but wherever they are in their story, there's a way to connect with someone. It's on Instagram, Facebook, a blog, a podcast, a book. There are just so many ways and so many tools. And so I find that it's my duty and responsibility to continue sharing my story, but more than that, um, to share resources with people and to show that we're absolutely not alone. We can do this together and we get to own our stories and connect with others and, um, and drink a lot of fun non-alcoholic beverages. I'm a huge proponent of that and you can follow me at Zero Proof Nation if you want get lots of uh, fun tips on great NA beverages uh, to just live a fun, booze-free lifestyle. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Again, my name is Laura Silverman. I'm in long-term recovery. I'm a booze-free babe, and I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs> You gotta love that audience clap, and I love that. I know. <laughs> and if you want to, um, when you're done, when we're done, if you want to go to the Facebook page and put all the links to all your social media, everyone, that's totally cool too. Um, all right, next up. So he's a young fella I've met. I don't even know how many years ago. Um, him and his sidekick Ryan Hampton. 
um, pretty much do everything with each other. So if there's Ryan, there's always Garrett. And to be able to see you grow from, you know, new to recovery. And, and when I first met you all those years ago, to see what you're doing for this whole universe, it is utterly amazing to me. Um, you know, and, you know, what you do and how you advocate. Um, I see it, you know, and I feel it every time I'm on any Zoom or anything with you, how passionate you are, you know, helping those with addiction. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart personally. Um, but you can talk about all the, he's got big bio. He's part of all kinds of companies, rap and voices project, mobilize recovery. Again, wherever there's Ryan, there's Garrett. So um, and with that, I give you Garrett Hayde. Thank you. thank you, honestly, and thank you for that introduction. And and yes, my name is Garrett Hayda. Uh, I'm a person in recovery uh, since March 3rd, 2015. And before I start real quick, it was five years ago, and we randomly called John and the McShin Foundation because we were on a cross-country trip in an RV, and we were out of money. We had no money for gas or food, and John had never met us before, and he took a chance on us, and he helped us with some funds to make it all the way to Virginia to meet you guys. And for that, we are forever grateful because I probably would be on a different track today if it wasn't for you all and, and the mentorship you give us. So thank you both and the work that the McShin Foundation does. Um, but I am the co-founder of the Voices Project, Recovery Advocacy Project, Mobilize Recovery. And I wanted to just tell a quick story today. I'm gonna go a little bit back from that five-year mark of meeting you both, and, and it's a story that, that takes place where I originally found recovery in Pasadena, California. Um, and, uh, you know, I was in this mentality of I was going to stay very quiet, uh, certainly wasn't going to talk about my past, and definitely wasn't going to let people know that I was newly in recovery unless you were part of my inner circle and you were living at the residence with me or going to meetings with me. Um, I was certainly not going to jump on a care talks to publicly talk about it. But something happened in my probably five month mark where um, my very first uh, brush with um, being with somebody one day and having them gone from a preventable drug overdose the next day. And when Nick came home and begged for help and we drove him to the hospital because he had no money and no insurance and, and couldn't stay at the house anymore, um, the best solution we had at the time was like, let's take you to the hospital. They'll certainly help you for a couple days and then you can come back. Um, Nick never got the opportunity to get the help he needed. He overdosed while walking back after being released after three hours. A few months later, um, our friend Tyler overdosed while living in a recovery residence, um, while experiencing an overdose, surrounded by people who were not trained on how to respond to an overdose, who were not trained on how to use naloxone, nor had naloxone, um, did not recognize that when they heard that garble noise that Tyler was going through, that telling him to just go sleep it off was a good idea. Um, and had any of those things taken place, Tyler would be alive today. And you know what's really um, kind of propelled myself and Ryan and others in our community into this uh, advocacy mode um, was the mentality that we heard from people that this is just the way it is. And the sad part is, is that it's not that there's any responsibility of uh, the healthcare system. It's really that you all don't want to uh, be in recovery bad enough. Um, you know, honestly mentioned Ryan. So I had this great mentor who had a uh, political organizing background. Myself was a convicted felon who spent 10 years, you know, struggling on the streets, uh, mm -hmm never involved in any sort of form of politics, nor thought I could vote. But Ryan said we had to organize the community. And I said, sure, let's try it. Nothing's working. Uh, the homes won't listen to us. We've even offered to do free naloxone trainings. Um, we've even offered to donate naloxone to them. They won't take it. They say it encourages people to use. Um, we reached out to some local elected officials. They weren't answering our calls. So we went back to those homes and we went back to our community and we said, guys, show up to our house at this date, at this time, and we're going to feed you all. And everyone showed up. And, uh, and we had pancake party. But really what we did is we went and got voter registration forms. And we registered over 100 people to vote. And as soon as that happened, a light switch went off because 
the, our, our sitting council people uh, came to the house. Our congresswoman came to the house, uh, house and worked with us. We met with our state senator because they just realized that we could organize a community around an issue. And, and uh, that had power and our voices had power. And we didn't need to know much about what was going on other than we were tired of watching our friends die and being ignored. Um, you know, fast forward a few years, that um, effort turned into uh, a state law that required overdose response plans. It turned into a federal law that was named after our friend Tyler um, that passed in 2017 called Tyler's Law, which for the first time spelled out what standards for a recovery residents look like, including overdose prevention plans. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned as a community organizer is that there's still more work to be done just because a law has passed does not mean it's enforced. Uh, another story for another time. But that, I tell that story because of this, right? That was not one organization or a, uh, or a single person. That was a rallying cry from a local community. Um, since that event happened back five and a half, six years ago, um, we were granted a million units of naloxone to be distributed over three years. Um, and, and it was primarily to go to recovery residences all across the country. It's now being expanded into community organizations as well. Um, the formation of the recovery advocacy project has given us this really cool avenue of trying to replicate that, um, local and state community organizing model. Um, right now, there are currently 37 active state teams with over 350 community organizers who all organize and strategize uh, and use proven organizing tactics to change either policy or community solutions based on what the needs are of their local community at any given time. Um, you know, what I'm experiencing where I currently live in Nevada might be completely different than what's going on in Virginia in, in your neck of the woods right now. So how could we have one uh, overarching plan to get things done when the needs differ so much? Um, the, the, going back to that story, though, um, and that million units of naloxone donation, I got a call a few months ago from a colleague, and he said to me, he goes, I got to tell you something that's really, really cool. He's like that story of about you and Ryan and your community in Pasadena where you, um, you know, rallied the troops, registered people to vote. That turned into a law, which then turned into a, uh, a, a, a national campaign where uh, naloxone's being distributed. I got a phone call where a person five and a half years later in South Carolina right now is distributing 8,000 units of naloxone based on the work that a local community did five and a half years ago. We never know what our actions in a local community will take and what, what, national, uh, what, what will happen on a national landscape. I certainly didn't expect that. I was just tired of watching my friends um, be not listened to, not heard of, their lives and everything being, being the blame being put on them with no responsibility on the healthcare system. So leading into, uh, coming up into September and leading into this convening that we hold every year called Mobilize Recovery. Like I said, I was very fortunate. I had great mentors who had done community and political organizing before. Um, I didn't know what I was doing back then. I didn't know what community organizing was. I didn't know that's what was happening, right? Like I said, we were just pissed off. Um, Mobilized recovery is kind of a convening of, of organizers, people in recovery, family members, um, other organizations. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a large convening and a training of how to use proven and effective organizing uh, engagement tactics and to hopefully empower the next generation of, of, of uh, recovery advocates. And when we talk about the recovery movement, we're talking about family members, harm reductionists, uh, recovery, people in recovery, uh, allies. If we're all going to make change, coming together and organizing correctly um, and using proven tactics to do it, um, we could be the largest and most powerful constituency in this country. Um, I have to, you know, if it wasn't for organizations like the McShin Foundation and and uh, you know Foundation for Recovery and and Partnership to End Addiction, helping us to put something like this together, where 
it is not one voice or, or it's not one organization or anything like that. This is a, a collective movement of advocates who, if we rally together, could create change. So if you are interested in advocacy or you're just not knowing what you're doing or you think your voice doesn't matter, um, I assure you it does. And if you would like to attend Mobilize Recovery, it's virtual this year as well as in person. I'll go back into the Facebook post later and put the link in, but um, we'd love for everyone to participate in this um, and, and again, learn some of the organizing tactics to help effectively make change in your local community, because who knows where it'll, where it'll end up after we do that that way. So thank you for allowing me to be here. And I, again, sincerely from the bottom of my heart, appreciate John and honesty and the McShin Foundation and, and, and love being part of Care Talks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, and thank you for everything you do. We will see you in Vegas in September. I've never been to Vegas, so I'm excited. Um, it'll be cool being in recovery, though. Um, all right, our next speaker. So he's a mentor of mine. I met Joseph years ago through Faces and Voices of Recovery, and I'm honored to be able to help with uh, awesome accreditation that they do through CAPRIS, and he has trained me. Um, well, many, many things throughout the years, and he's super fun, super funny, and always a joy to be on um, Zooms with him, you know, the cool Zooms where you can text each other, you know, so he definitely uh, makes it makes it a party for sure, sober party. Um, so with that, I give you Joseph Sanchez. Thank you, honesty, and I, I just can't get over the uh, the automated applause and audience. I just love it. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Laura and Garrett. Laura, your recovery date is my birthday, so I'll remember it. So yay, July fourteenth, awesome. Um, I, I've uh, I'm coming to you from a, a new space, my new office space, and uh, on this new platform or new to me platform like Honesty had said, I'm more used to a Zoom platform, but uh, one of the awesome benefits that recovery has given me is that um, just recently, my husband and I closed on uh, our first house together. Uh, so my name is Joseph Hogan Sanchez. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am a person in long-term recovery. I established my recovery in uh, Borderland, Texas, El Paso, Texas on October 2nd of 2005. I am a direct product of peer recovery support services um, and, and a huge fan of that. A, a lot of for us, by us uh, stuff. So uh, in way of advocacy, um, really being able to um, uh, be a, a part of somebody's recovery and recovery journey, you know, from the, from the get go and from the start. And that has really afforded me the opportunity to grow in many, many different ways and uh, be able to afford, um, you know, uh, awesome gifts like this. And don't look at the bath and body. That's that's the that's maybe that's the uh, uh, the addiction uh, going over. That's the candles. But uh, I digress. So. Um, when honesty invited me to care talks i was like oh what do i talk about and you know there's there's so many different things to talk about and I, i'm glad that uh, uh garrett brought up the advocacy component um because there are so many uh different um things to talk about and to advocate for in in, in way of substance use disorder and recovery um and we still see a lot of um uh, populations that are are falling through the cracks. Um, the LGBT uh, plus population is is one of those uh, those communities that still are underserved. Um, when we look at the uh, the numbers of uh, communities that are most underserved, it's the LGBTQ plus and those that are uh, unhoused. 
And um, as a uh, gay man myself, um, you know, there are, you know, there are a lot of obstacles. And fortunately, because I started my recovery process in my hometown, I was able to get tapped into a lot of uh, different resources. But there are a, a lot of things to consider when it comes to supporting um, uh, folks in the LGBT community. Um, so if you think about, um, if you think about just substance use disorder alone, um, sometimes with that there is, you know, mental health or, or mental illness uh, going along with that. So co-occurring uh, co disorders and uh, any types of, uh, you know, STDs or uh, STIs, uh, maybe HIV or AIDS. So you have a, a third thing going on and maybe even um, uh, process addictions. Um, so you might have in one person a quadruple diagnosis and you know acute uh, uh, support or acute treatment in a, uh, in a clinical environment may be cutting somebody uh, short in, in, in way of support. Um, and most communities uh, really have uh, very limited amount of resources when it comes to the amount of supports. Um, in 2020, we saw a lot of um, disconnection, not only from our communities, um, you know, from a recovery standpoint, um, but a disconnection from each other, but also um, what was brought to our attention nationally is a lot of um, uh, more injustice and inequity and racism. And um, we it, it's clear now and it's evident now that a lot of things do need to be addressed and should be addressed. And that's another point of advocacy. So when we start thinking about um, how we uh, provide services or supports or even how we engage with folks, how, we, how are we doing that in an equitable system? and how do we advocate for uh, that in our communities. Uh, so recently I just um, uh, shared um, a bit of my story on um, a uh, national ed education, something or rather, and you know, it, the topic was around uh, the impact of uh, family and culture. And as a uh, Hispanic Latinx, uh, person, uh, gay person at that, uh, culture affects my recovery immensely. Along in, in this uh, move to this new house, um, you know, my family was present. My family has been a huge part of my recovery. On my uh, recovery anniversary, my mom always calls me and she says, how much time do we have? And um, and we celebrate that together. And, you know, she's uh, been a huge part of, my family's been a huge part of my recovery, but has also been a huge part uh, of some of my active uh, addiction and that uh, codependent uh, dynamic that comes along with that culture as well. Uh, the looking away of uh, and maybe not addressing. So when we think about how we, uh, support individuals, how we uh, advocate for the way we do things, uh, we can't just automatically assume that just because we've educated ourselves on a, a few different cultures that we are good to go when we have it uh, locked down. Um, so it's a, not just about uh, the education component, but it's about the community assessment and engaging the communities and, uh, and different communities in a participatory process and saying, what's working, uh, what's working well, and uh, you know what can be improved. Uh, identifying existing resources and helping to partner and collaborate with them um, and truly building a, a, out a recovery-oriented system of care and making sure that those cultural considerations are kept in mind in building out the systems of care so that no one falls through the, cap, uh, the cracks and we are truly looking at an equitable system of care. I see my one minute warning here. Uh, it's really been an awesome, uh, you know, uh, 
opportunity to not only just um, see how we talk about recovery um, nationally, but to see more people talk about recovery nationally from whatever pathway, it, at least we're talking about it, we're bringing it to light and we are seeing that uh, it is uh, a possibility and there are many, many different uh, uh, pathways and it's all possible. So uh, reach out to the folks at McShin Foundation, the folks on all the different care talks um, and you know, uh, I'll throw my contact information um, and Faces and Voices of Recovery, we are always here to help with our 150 plus uh, ARCO members out there across the United States. Thanks. I oh, know. I love the clapping. Todd's the greatest. Todd Widows um, is our studio director. He's up in the little green corner hiding. Um, he's very creative and does all of this cool stuff in the background. He's amazing. I make the flyer and then he does the, all that stuff. So it's cool. Um, our last speaker before our break um, is a super sweet young lady uh, that is at McShin right now. She came in, um, just wanted to change her life. And ever since really the past few weeks, she's been on a whirlwind of interviews and news articles and, um, you know, and then we had a time to have a long conversation one day and it just warms my heart to see these young ladies coming through McShen and really want, you know, to change their life from the life that they was li they were living before. And um, she's definitely got heart spunk. She's ready to uh, make some changes for sure, you know, in this movement. So she's the next generation of this recovery movement. With that, with that I give you Monique Runge. you so much uh honestly for that incredible introduction um and you know thank you and john so much for giving me this opportunity this little platform to be part of um my name is monique runge i am a woman in recovery from substance use disorder um and my entryway into addiction solution um is a little bit different from most people's um I'm like what you would call the free spirit of the family, um, you know, always traveling, always, you know, working at festivals, uh, teaching yoga, doing whatever um, I really wanted to do. Um, had the perfect high rise apartment, downtown LA, the perfect quote unquote friends, um, perfect Instagram aesthetic, because, you know, without that, obviously your life is in shambles. Um, but I was always feeling like I missed something. I was missing out on some particular secret to life. Um, I thought it was my proximity to my family, which is what brought me back to Richmond, Virginia. Um, you know, and even though I had this opportunity to reconnect with my family, um, spend time with my sisters, um, I realized that what I really missing was missing was um, happiness. You know, um, teaching yoga wasn't doing it. Um, traveling to literally everywhere wasn't doing it. Um, and, you know, I uh, suffer from alcoholism. So, you know, I'm thinking being social, drinking, um, that's the only way I can connect with people. Um, I love what Laura said earlier, you know, about the um, opposite of addiction is connection. Um, so... I finally kind of threw my hands up and told my dad, you know, I'm ready to make a change. Um, you know, so he brought me to McShin. And to be honest, how hyped up everyone was, was a little um, irritating at first, to say the least. I'm like, there is no way that these people are that happy about being sober. There's just no way, um, you know. And uh, finally, you know, the first day I'm there, we have this huge house meeting uh, John gets up there and actually is just very real, very to the point. I'm like, finally, someone that seems normal 
Um, you know, so I entered in on an intensive program, uh, no phone, that was terrible, no social media, right? And um, we went to meetings every day. Um, and towards the end of it, I kind of was like, you know, if everybody else is willing to bet on me, if uh, McShin is direct, like willing to bet on me, um, I have to bet on myself. So, you know, I did this little bet with my dad. Okay, if you pay one month, I'll, I'll at least say another month. Um, so that's, you know, where I'm at currently. I'm in a, a step up program here now. Um, and, you know, going to the meetings a lot, I started to actually see real people being with real clean time um, being happy, uh, genuinely happy, not this fake, um, fake enthusiasm. Um, and I finally was like, that is what I want. You know, that's really what I want. And, um, you know, I will say that this year is the first year in 15 years I've celebrated my birthday sober. Um, you know, finally made a connection with some women that have clean time or in recovery. Um, and, you know, I've, my friend group, we have suffered a lot of loss from addiction. Um, a week before my birthday, two of my close friends passed away um, from relapsing. And the difference was, is that they kind of gave up, not really gave up, but they all of a sudden felt like they had it, you know, they got it. They didn't need to go to meetings anymore. And as sad as it was, it was like a really big wake up call. Um, the second that you stop working anything, um, whatever pathway you choose is when you will, you know, unexpectedly fail. Um, so, you know, I like to say, go by McShin, get in the herd, you know, talking to women, uh, you know, talking to women, connecting, going out to dinner, not having any drinks instead of meeting up for brunch, I'm meeting up to go to meetings. Um, and it's really brought back these, this sense of joy and a lot of activities that I used to love, like hula hooping, as silly as that sound, um, dancing, doing yoga, sitting out in the sun, like no wonder cats like to do this. It is fantastic. Um, and now it's like finally when I'm posting on social media, it's not this hidden mask. It's not, oh, this is um, just a persona that I'm putting on. It finally is, oh, I'm making this post because I'm happy and I'm genuinely happy um, not to get any likes, not to gain more followers. It's just genuinely who I am now. Um, and the best part, the greatest gift that this recovery journey has given me is uh, that reconnection with my family. You know, it gives me a different perspective on everything because I always felt like I was the problem. Like, why um, why are we not connecting? But who wants a drunk around? You know, it's not very fun. Um, and I'm kind of learning that I'm pretty cool by myself. You know, a sober Monique is a pretty awesome Monique. Um, so, you know, I just... Um, with addiction comes really, you know, big OCD issues. And I've always been obsessive over different things, whether it's a band, um, teaching yoga, mm -hmm. following certain festivals. Um, and now it's like, you know, like honestly said, I'm in this whirlwind of uh, so many opportunities to be connected and to get in the herd uh, that it finally you know, clicked, um, you know, how in college in my logic class, I'll never forget, you know, he said, this is either going to click or this is going to fail. And only 38% of you are going to make it. Well, I want to be, you know, I wanted to click for sobriety. I wanted to click for recovery. Um, I did not pass that college course, by the way. Absolutely not. But I feel like I do not want to fail at recovery. Um, and, you know, I'm so determined and I'm so happy to be part of this program and to be part of a program that has strong women in leadership positions um, with a lot of clean time. And, you know, look at honesty. She looks great. She's happy. Laura, you look fantastic. Do not look 38 at all. Um, you know, and I'm just really excited to bring, you know, yoga classes, um, you know, workshops about healthy eating, things that you know, an everyday healthy person should know, but gets thrown to the side because we're so distracted with whatever substance that we want to use that we just don't even 
you know, grab hold of any of these opportunities. Um, so that is, you know, what my goal is now. And um, I'm very happy to be part of the McShen Foundation and to be part of the younger generation of um, in recovery because, you know, being young, it's so uncool to be sober. Um, but I would like to help change that perspective of, you know, you can be young and be sober and be fun and, um, you know, have a great time um, and still still get the best out of life. I mean, if not the best um, opportunities and life experience that you've ever had before. Um, so I do just want to say thank you one more time. Thank you to um, the speakers that have spoken before me. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. That was great. You're amazing. And I'm so excited for your future. And um, yeah, I'm just excited, you know, to be able to see these young folks come in. And thank you for the great compliments because I still am super young and I love it. So um, but I guess we're going to go ahead and take a break. I want to thank all of you guys and gals and everyone uh, for taking the time out of your night um, on a holiday weekend. I didn't even realize it was because I don't do nothing for Memorial Day ever. So I didn't, I didn't even realize it was a holiday weekend. So thanks again for a double thank you for, for spending time with us. But we're going to take a few minutes break and then we'll be back with our next speakers. Yeah, I, I want to add, thank you very much. All y'all did a fabulous job, man. And, and you know, I just want to remind people, these care talks, we, we crank them out to these tablet companies in jails and prisons. And I think in the past year, we have like close to a million views on these for kids and, you know, people behind bars. So this is a big deal for folks who can't get out and see these things. So if you're watching this, you know, that, that's a good hit. But these things are going to go on forever. So, but y'all were fabulous. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, we'll see you right after the break. What is it, five minutes? Yeah, about. <clears throat> see y'all in five minutes. How do you start a recovery community organization? How do you start a recovery community center? The recovery industry, the recovery as we know, is an emerging, <laughs> emerging and I, in part to organizations like McShen, but recovery people everywhere, they're getting involved and they want to know how they can maximize the outcome of their efforts. It's not for the, for the meek at heart or the weak of mind. You got to have some real inward strength, fortitude, courage, because, you know, it's a, it gets to be a day and night, seven day a week, 365 day a year industry. There's nothing so simple about it. You know, how to create awesome, authentic recovery community oriented systems of care with whatever it is you're working with. We have, I think, one of the finest authentic recovery community organizations in North America. You know, we have a 15,000 square foot recovery center, over 100 recovery beds. We're currently full time in three jails. You know, we've we showed other local recovery communities how to percolate, emerge, and become good, awesome organizations. So, a lot to learn here, a lot of reason to be part of this. So, more later. Thank you very much. My name is Jillian Nye, and I'm the Director of Female Programs here at the McShim Foundation. I'm Carla. I'm the Assistant Director of Female Programs. We have an amazing women's program house out in Chester, Virginia. I've seen so many women's lives change since entering into the McShim Foundation, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. This is where the girls get to experience recovery in a more intimate setting. The house that they live in sits on about three acres of land and in the back they have a horse pasture where we are able to get animals out there. Soon we should have chickens and goats and all type of different animals. They also get to have their groups here at the house. I've seen so many women's lives change and it's amazing to be able to see that. What I like to see is when they come in and when they leave, I see the difference. 
um, out there. They have a group room. They have a exercise room. They have a therapy room. They have no outside distractions going on. They have an amazing opportunity out here to live together. You've got to, for your recovery, you've got to understand like this is a life or death situation. Anytime we go use, we get, we're susceptible, you know, we just are, no matter what drug it is or anything. Out here at the Chester Program Women's House, this is where they get acclimated in their recovery foundation for the first 28 days. Communication is the key to recovery. Yeah, we can say just don't use over here. You know, just don't use. Sometimes just don't use, that's great. You know, I, I live by because I don't use no matter what, but also there's so much more over here that you got to work on in your soul. This is a really good opportunity for females to come in where they get to build relationships with other women that they live with because a lot of us come in and we have past trauma with women or have never had a woman figure in our life. They get to work through all that in early recovery. The reward though is seeing you guys, seeing people like Ms. P coming back because she wanted to, seeing women get their children back, you know, seeing you guys, you know, develop relationships. That's what wakes me up in the morning and gets me to come to McShann and you guys, you know, and, and seeing our alumni and like this, there's a million stories I could tell you about awesome women that have come through McShen and like where they're at now. So if you're a female that is looking for a program recovery house, Chesterfield House will be an amazing opportunity for you to come out. And this is where you'll be able to found a great foundation of recovery. My name is Honesty Liller and I'm a woman in long-term recovery and what that means to me is I've been drug and alcohol free since May 27, 2007. I tried every form of treatment for my heroin addiction and what worked for me is a strong network of recovering people and the McShen Foundation. I am able to walk in my purpose every single day here at McShen and help people just like me. I lived in the female house for five months and then started my employment here at McShen. So that was lots of years ago, gosh, almost 14 years ago, and I have been the CEO for over seven years. I get to experience people's lives changing right in front of me, along with reducing that negative outlook on addiction to our community in this area and nationally at large. It is very important for me to speak up uh, for those, you know, that need our services, but also specifically, I love helping the moms here in our program um, because my story is I was a mom in addiction and it's just really, really important for us to be innovative in the addiction field and the recovery community. It is important for me in my personal recovery to continually wake up every morning and help someone, whether it's someone new in recovery, help someone in the community in general, or someone in long-term recovery. It doesn't matter. Matter. Recovery has taught me how to be a mom, how to be a wife, how to be a CEO, how to love myself and be a woman leader in this community. So I want to thank you for all of your energy and all of your support of our mission of healing families and saving lives.
Well, 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 welcome back, man. I tell you what, man, we're going to have fun tonight, you know. Um, we just had a great first half, had some great speakers, man. We got several great speakers lined up for the second half, and I can't wait to hear from these folks. Uh, we got a couple on Central Time. They, they'll they be checking in here momentarily. You know, they, they forget we're on East Coast time, you know. That's what happens when you get newcomers giving these talks. But anyways, uh, we're going to jump right into it. Honestly, you got anything to add before we jump into it? We good to go. All right, listen up. This 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 first speaker we got here, a young lady. I met her, what, two, three years ago? I can't remember how long. It seems like a long time, but it was probably only a couple years ago. She was, she was in my office yesterday. I think it was. She's going, John. You know, we can sit down and have a 30-minute conversation. I don't get five words in. And she says, man, I'm going to have a hard time with eight minutes. I said, are you kidding me? Just be yourself. Eight minutes will go by. We'll have to cut you off. But a very powerful young lady, one of those rising stars in the recovery space, you know, and just a doer, you know what I mean? She never, never says no, always doing something good in recovery, and just, just becoming this little beacon of hope, you know, so... I can't wait to hear what she got to say for the next eight minutes, but let's give a warm welcome to Dixie Lewis. Hi guys, my name is Dixie, like John said. Um, I'm a person of recovery. I haven't found it necessary to use in a little over two years now I was absolutely in John's office yesterday I get a little bit of anxiety so bear with me um so I'm actually an alumni of the Mission Foundation I came here like I said a little over two years ago February 1st 2019 um that week prior to me coming through I had overdosed a lot um my dad had actually talked to one of his friends who knew John through the jail program and got me in the next day the next morning um, when I first came in, my story has a lot to do with jail. So I went through jail a lot, um, in and out constantly. Would go in, stay in for five, six months, 30 days, whatever, and then stay out 30 days maybe, and then um, go right back. Um, this last time, I I feel like I just had enough. Um, I remember my sister, I went to my went, went to my sister after I got out of the hospital from overdose and my family came in and I was like, they're trying to make me go to rehab. She was like, go, you have so much fun. It's like a mini vacation. I had never been to any type of anything other than jail to get um, clean. So it was an experience for me to say the least. When I came in, I um, didn't know what to expect. Um, I was used to living with females because of um, being in jail so often. So I came in and I lived in the intensive house. Um, I went through the intensive program. I stayed in there for about 36 days. And then um, I eventually went to sober living where I lived for like 10 months after that. I lived in housing for a total of 11 months. In that process, I I absolutely loved it. You know, through my using, I didn't have friends. Um, I didn't have a relationship with my family. I a son who I had no custody of um, through my addiction, I actually got a CPS case and lost custody of him and was, I had a no contact order. Um, so through this process, I really didn't have anything when I first came in. Um, so coming in and living with these women was odd to me, but I actually found to love it. I um, I grew these relationships and I found that like I can actually be friends with females. Um, after moving out of intensive housing, I, I was able to go out with the new friends that I made, not only the ones that I lived with, but the ones I met outside of my recovery house. Um, I learned how to build connections with women, which was a big part of, and which is still a big part of my recovery. Um, that human connection that I was missing for so long. Um, so that's what I did for the little bit. My, for a long time, I just worked and I had a lot of fun and I went out to dinner. I found out I love to eat. Um, and so I started to eat, going out to eat a lot. I would do fun things like go to King's Dominion and I just really started living. 
um, that I really feel like that's when I started living. I started using at such a young age. I missed out on so much. And at first I struggled with the piece of, I got clean at 24. Um, I struggled with, you know, missing out on the bar scene or whatever. Um, and then I realized pretty quickly, like I wasn't missing out on nothing, like going to the bowling alley or something like that was enough for me. Um, so I started doing things like that. And in that process, in my process, I have um, slowly gotten things back. I, I tried not to rush anything. I really focused on myself for a little bit. And slowly through that process, I was able to get vi supervised visitation on my son, which eventually turned into unsupervised visitation and then slowly turned into um, joint custody. And now it has turned into 50-50 custody with my mother. Um, I've gotten a lot of things back. I've built relationships with women that have clean time and that have less clean time than me. Um, and I embrace that and I love that. Like I said before, I never had that before. I, growing up, I always had an issue with women. And since being here, they're my, my ace, as I'd like to say. Um, they're my go-to and I never would have imagined that. I can go to a female now and speak openly with them and be honest with them and not and not feel like I can't for the most part. Um, and I feel like living in the recovery house here, it's such a close, a really um, close community that I was given that opportunity. And being here, I learned a lot of like tools to grow in my recovery. Um, everybody that works here as well are, are, are um, also addicts and that helped me a lot through my process um being able to go to them when i was feeling any type of way and um and and talk to them about it knowing that they've more than likely been through it um i feel like that's a big reason why i stayed as long as i did or stayed even my 30 days that i originally had planned on um but like i said going through this process i've gotten a lot of things back McShin really gave me before coming in you know john kind of touched in on um the these going these videos going into the jails and i think that is amazing I, sh I say this a lot but where i'm from it's a very small community and they don't know what recovery is it's not offered to anybody it's not talked about i don't even think there's any meetings of any sort type um so I think it's amazing that these videos go into the jail programs or to jails just to show them um, that they can live a different life when they come home. I think it's amazing because I did not know anything about it until I got introduced to the McShin program and to the McShin Foundation. And that's why I'm so thankful. Um, they gave me all the tools that I needed to like follow through with my pathway or, you know, and um, build these relationships and get things back like my child. Like I'm currently in my office right now because I have a five-year-old at my house that will not give me any peace and quiet. So I had to run over here really quick to do this um, just so I could focus a little bit. Um, but I'm grateful for these problems today. Like I get to have a five-year-old screaming at me, not really screaming, but you know, yelling at me that needs this or this, or just wanting to be on me all the time. Because for so many years, I wasn't able to be a mother. Um, and at first I, I struggled with that a lot, but now I'm, I'm in a position today where I'm able to be there for my son. Um, that's what my recovery has given me my process. And I'm really beyond grateful for that and the women before me have showed me and taught me and guided me through this um, transition that I've been going through with my family, my, my son. In this process over my past couple years, I have experienced a lot of death, one of which was my little sister and um, Nixon Foundation is literally my safe place. Um, this is where I run to at any little inconvenience you know instead of most people call their mom I, I run here ran here so much finally they decided to give me a position here which i'm so grateful for and i love um and i'm honored that you know um i'm able to be a part of this that um that I, i'm a part of this family here that i'm trusted um 
And then I get to do this with you guys tonight. I think it's amazing. Um, if uh, you would have asked me if I was doing anything like this two years ago, it would have been absolutely not. I couldn't even fathom it. Even, you know, at any point in time, I never would have thought that I was where I'm at today. And honestly, if it wasn't for the people that I've built relationships with through this process, I probably wouldn't have it. Um, they, my friends, the my chosen family are a big reason why I'm still where I'm at today um, to keep me in check and they've kept me in position or helped put me kept helped keep me in position and for that i'm forever grateful um it's been one hell of a ride um but it's been an amazing one it wasn't always rainbows and sunshine but i'm still here as well as y'all and i'm grateful to be here thank you guys for having me i love you guys bye that's all i got <laughs> Well, I, t I told you eight minutes ago, but I get ain't nothing <laughs> on your head. You know, we uh, we got our couple latecomers going to be tuning in on the show here. But, uh, you know, my family growing up, man, you, you served the meal in front of you. So, oh, look, well, welcome newcomers to the show. So now see y'all to make it tonight, man. The, um, you know, just a reminder, you know, now that the state of Virginia is open back up and there's not a lot of limits on anything, we, we this Monday we're having our annual Memorial Day picnic at McShen. We do a wonderful cookout. It's noon to four, somewhere in that area. Plenty of hamburgers and hot dogs and what to five, one to five, one to four. So, but we'll be out there cooking at noon, probably at eleven thirty, but. We usually get hundreds of folks come on out. Any politicians in the neighborhood, we let them come by and shake hands, kiss babies, give out bumper stickers, and <laughs> give a microphone, say a few words why we should vote for them or not. Uh, Courtney probably knows about that. But uh, I got a list in front of me. I'm going to go by the list of, of who's up next because I, I see Jimmy and his beautiful wife, Chelsea, tuned in. And I happen to know why they're probably late because they – they're dealing with some life on life terms issues down there in Arkansas. And if anybody knows anything about Arkansas, it gets real down there sometimes. So, but Jim is our next speaker. And I got to tell you the truth, man, Jim, he's an, he's an incredible young man, a, a wonderful speaker. He just wrote a book and I don't, I don't read a lot of books <clears> outside <throat> of my recovery books, but I read Jim's book from prison to purpose, cover to cover. I couldn't put it down. And I thought to myself, and then there, here's the hit. See, I sponsored him. And I'm thinking as I'm reading that book, I said, well, it's going to make the fifth step real easy. You know what I mean? So <laughs> <laughs> it was, and then, and then I look at his wife, Chelsea, and I'm thinking, holy smoke, didn't you know who you were marrying, man? You should have wrote that book before you proposed to her and got married, man. But it worked out the way it worked out. Without further ado, let me introduce Jimmy McGill from <clears throat> Little Rock, Arkansas. All right, John. <laughs> hey. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me, I guess? Can you hear me? I can. You can? Okay, well, then they can too. Uh, thanks so much, John, Honesty, the McShen Foundation, uh, just for all the advocacy work that you guys do, for even trying to carry a message to a pandemic. It's It's amazing. Uh, to see the work and the recovery and the, the life change that comes from the McShen Foundation. You guys are hands down uh, the model RCO. We're fixing to open three or four down here in Arkansas, and we're trying to mo mimic the McShen Foundation model. And so uh, I'm forever grateful. And, and like John said, my name is Jimmy McGill, and I'm a, a guy in long-term recovery from addiction. And what that means to me is addiction doesn't have to be a death sentence. Right. Like there is a life worth living uh, after my years of repetitious drug use and recovery has given me purpose. Um, like anybody watching or anybody that's going to come watch, uh, my addiction story is not that spectacular. You know what I mean? Like it is there's nothing special. I'm not a unique person of addiction. Like I started out with moderate fun use and it was fun. I, I, you know, I may have been trying to escape pain. I don't know, but I got high because I like to get high. 
And the uh, problem was as, as I couldn't stop getting high. And so I went through all these uh, trials and tribulations that people in addiction go through. You know, I found myself constantly in and out of incarceration. I found myself in the grip of addiction. Uh, dope took me to some really, really bad places. And uh, my addiction became the driving force of my life. And nothing else mattered except for me to find and get and to find a way to use uh, and to try to stay free while I could do that. Little did I know that the physical prison wasn't the one that I would have to worry about. It would become the mental prison uh, and my drug use would become both my slave master and make me the slave to the very thing that uh, dictated my entire life. And so I'm in and out of jails and institutions. I'm a cuckoo bird uh, at this point in my life. Um, I hated being me and I thought I could put something inside my body and change the circumstances surrounding my body. Uh, you know, dope did what dope does. And so long story short, uh, in 2015, I successfully re-entered society after a number of failed attempts. Um, I had 23 years of active drug use. Uh, I had hepatitis C at that time. Uh, the odds of me staying clean were slim to none. Uh, me sustaining recovery in any, any capacity was highly unlikely. Uh, I had not seen my daughter in a number of years. I was by the textbook definition of deadbeat dad. Uh, my idea of a su successful relationship uh, was a couple of good fights, a water bump, and a police report. You know, if, if we had all those things, we were in a really good relationship. Uh, I had no idea what relationships were until I got got clean in recovery and found a new way to live. Um, you know, I met my wife in recovery. Uh, I found hope in recovery. Everything that addiction took from me, recovery gave me back. Um, and I say that because I was 38 years old when I when I found when I heard a message of hope from a hope dealer, and I identified immediately with the story. Now he didn't look like me. None of them looked like me. They were polished. They had a little bit of weight on them. I'm fresh out of the penitentiary, so my ego is driving me, and I am trying to, by all means, be. Uh, the coolest guy in the room, the toughest guy on the block. And so little did I know that in recovery, nobody really cares about that, right? They want to know about what good you're doing for humanity today and how they can help you stay clean uh, and inspire you. And so, um, yeah, I stuck around and I bought into this thing called hope. And the next thing you know, I had been out for three or four months and I had not used yet. Um, and that alone was a miracle. The fact that I came home and didn't get high on my first day uh, out of prison as I did every other time that I was released into society. Um, what I did different was I found a community of recovery and I surrounded myself with new people in new places uh, that were encouraging me to try new things. And so I remained teachable and Somebody said, well, Jimmy, you sure like to talk a lot. Why don't you go to school? And I said, OK, well, I will go to school. Watch this. And so I went to school. I couldn't get a job anywhere, man. Um, getting a job was next to impossible. Try to understand, you know, I just filed for my pardon uh, and we thought I had 17 felony convictions. I guess I have 19. We found two new mm -hmm. ones. Um, and so I've got all these criminal convictions and a lot of them are theft they revolve around drug use you know how we get down when we're in active addiction and uh, so nobody wants to employ me like they won't even give me a job uh, mowing grass because they're afraid I'll steal the grass after I cut it uh, it was very difficult I was in, living in a recovery residence I was trying to maintain my recovery uh, and at the same time be responsible and pay bills and um, but I didn't give up. I didn't use. Uh, I continued to do the right thing. I struggled. The only thing I've done perfectly is not put a substance in my body. Um, along that way, uh, my gratitude kicked in and I refused uh, to shut up about recovery. And in Arkansas, uh, publicly sharing your recovery was very taboo. It was it was almost unheard of. And so I and, and the culture that I found my recovery in, it is definitely not really acceptable. 
And so here I am, the black sheep of the family, the guy challenging the status quo, who's so glad to not be high that I refuse to shut up about it. So I'm sharing my recovery in and out of my fellowship. I'm sharing it at churches, at schools, anywhere people will ask me. And so you've got to understand that I was the epitome of a criminal. I was the textbook poster child for the guy who was supposed to die either during incarceration or with a syringe in his arm. And so the fact that I was clean in my city that I had raised devastating hell in for decades was a big deal, not just to me, but a big deal to everybody. And so the next thing you know, I'm speaking well, beside law enforcement, right? Like same cops that used to arrest me are asking me if I'll come talk to somebody for them. And then, and then uh, out of nowhere, I, I decided to host an event for a nonprofit that I was working with. And so I tapped into all the recovery communities, all the different fellowships, all the different pathways from everything from CrossFit to churches to faith-based to 12-step to MAT. I had all these people at this, this event uh, to raise awareness for uh, drug and alcohol prevention and recovery. And so from that one event, I spoke, there was probably four or 500 people there and uh I got an invitation to go speak at the state capitol. And so, of course, the entire recovery community showed up for that in Arkansas because uh, that was the first time that one of their own had been asked to come share a seat beside the decision makers in this state. Now, I understand it may be like that and have been like that for years in other states, but in Arkansas, that was the night that uh, one of their own uh, made it to the seat. To, to that side of the street. And so it's not that they were showing up to support Jimmy, though that was part of it. They were showing up to support themselves because one of our own had touched the microphone beside our state leadership. Uh, well, during that night, our drug czar was there. Now I have a long history with our drug czar. Um, I've been following his career since he was a patrolman. I just did it from the back seat of the cop car. This guy arrested me a number of times. Uh, he was head of the criminal investigation division. He was over the drug county task force. Uh, he was over all of the narcotics divisions. And then he was the chief of police. And then he was like, you know, top notch FBI drug narc guy. Um, and the next thing you know, recovery has me in a position to where I'm working for this guy. And so he hears me speak. He offers me a job about a year later. And so in 2017, I become the first parolee to hold a state position in Arkansas. And so currently today, I am the recovery manager uh, for my entire state, which means I oversee, develop, implement, and evaluate all of the recovery initiatives that are funded through state money, SOR, STR, SOR2, all that. And so that was a real big change from going out of the, the isolation in the penitentiary to a government office. Um, and it was a real culture shock for me, right? Like half a DHS is still waiting on me to steal their car keys, you know? Um, but uh, my wife and I met at the coffee pot in a recovery meeting, uh, basically is how I like to say it. We started a nonprofit, uh, Sober Living, that uh, just received a $200,000 grant. I was able to write my first book. Uh, Honesty asked me to speak on the solutions of recovery, our uh, addiction solutions. And so in my book, you're the solution, right? Like we are the solution. People in recovery are the strongest solution to combat the disease of addiction that we're ever gonna see, right? Nothing is more powerful than one person in recovery walking beside another one. It really is the ultimate weapon. I like we identify and we're uniquely qualified to reach a group of people that society has deemed right off, yeah. unreachable and unteachable. And so if you're, not using today. If you're living a life better than the one that you were at your absolute worst, welcome to recovery and thank you for staying clean for today. Uh, I love it. I wouldn't trade this life for nothing at the world in the world, but I'm very vigilant about my recovery. Uh, like John said, he is my sponsor and I call him uh, a number of times throughout the week. Um, yeah, yesterday it was multiple times, you know. Uh, I know I can't recover alone and I've got better sense than to try it. So uh, if you haven't read the book from prison to purpose, it is on Amazon and it is definitely cut for people who struggle with incarceration and drug use. Uh, my name is Jimmy McGill. You can find me on social media at Jimmy McGill live 
I love you guys and thanks for letting me share. Man, good job, Jimmy, man. I, I knew I knew I knew what I was working with when we got you on the show tonight. You hey, know, really I, quick, can you put a link to your book when you go on Facebook on the things, Jimmy? Thanks. Yeah, and Todd, Todd will flash it across the screen if we get it up in time. The um, now see, I spent a little time down in Arkansas. And the last time I was down there, I got to meet Jimmy's wife and spend some time with Chelsea. So I had to analyze her, you know what I mean, just see what we were working with here. And I come to the conclusion that Jimmy, like myself, married up, married way up, you know. So, you know, the old nut don't fall far from the tree in our sponsorship line. You know, we have a lot of things in common. But, but you know, spend a little time with Chelsea, talking to Chelsea, knowing a little bit about her journey and where she's at. And I got another brainstorm. I haven't really talked to honesty about this, but we're going to do a, a conference on uh, married couples in recovery, you know, where we get these couples that are in recovery. But a lot of us work in the same space together, too. So, we need a lot of healing in that area. I've come to the conclusion, but you know, I don't want to take up a lot of Chelsea's time and, and, and I've never really heard her share, share outside of small circles and sitting around the fire we had down there, but, but I'm all ears. I can't wait to hear what she's got to say. Chelsea, take it away. Welcome to the show. <clears throat> everybody. I am Chelsea. I am a person in long-term recovery. I have been in recovery for eight years in April and um, I'm, a, I'm alive, you know. Um, so my journey is um, a little bit uh, different than Jimmy's. I am, um, I grew up you know, single mom, getting in trouble a lot. Just her and I was in and out of facilities very young. Um, you know, lots of psychiatric hospitals, um, youth homes. It was the whole, um, I can take care of myself. You know, I am 12 years old and I will, <laughs> you know, completely um, leave here and run my entire life. And it was because, you know, um, I feel like I was born with the disease of addiction. Well, I, I know I was like, I was absolutely um, born this way. I don't know if all of us are. I know that I was, and that's all that matters. And I know that I am um, all of the things. I will kill myself with drugs, alcohol. I will think myself to death. I will eat myself to death. I will, you know, um, uh, self-destruct um and so i have to what i found out especially through covid which i'm sure a lot of people can relate to is that um you know i had to switch some things up so i because even in recovery if i'm not working my program uh and whatever I've, you know whatever that is to me that works for me and it is uh it changes um that I can feel just as alone and just as sick uh, as I was when I, you know, got clean and sober eight years ago and, um, and all up before that. So some of the things that I was thinking um, that I've gotten to do in recovery is, uh, you know, Jimmy had mentioned uh, we met at the coffee pot, which is absolutely true. And I wouldn't be with anyone else other than someone, well, let's say other than him, but a person in recovery. You know, I hear people's stories about being with their normies and stuff. And I'm like, uh, no, 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 never. And, you know, maybe I, well, I know I was blessed in that area, but like, I'm like, you know, when I, got clean. I'm like, I'll just be by myself for the rest of my life. I'm straight, you know, like that's living my best life. And, um, so anyway, it was really cool because, you know, one of the things that we did do when we got together was, you know, start opening houses, sober living. We call them recovery houses. Um, that's kind of 
what they are to us, you know, and I will tell you, it's a very interesting dynamic because both of us has have very different, um, opinions. Um, I mean, we're, we're different, not to mention that we're, you know, different genders. Our recovery looks different. Our backgrounds are completely different. And so our houses are a combination of both of them and it shows and we have um, worked our butts off to um, figure that out. And neither one of us are willing to kind of let um, that process um, go. Because trust me, there's been many a times where we've thought, what are we doing? Like, you know, um, I, you know, I want to get out of working with in, in, you know, the disease of addiction. And, you know, it um, that hasn't been what was meant to be for us. So. Um, one of the things that was really cool was my wedding and my engagement, which was freaking the best day of my life, um, the wedding. And then, you know, I got proposed to in a group of like, oh my gosh, like a hundred people that I had gotten. Um, I had set up Jimmy a 40th birthday surprise. I mean, this is, I never even said the M word. The marriage word and you know I was like uh, every relationship was toxic you know the only times I've been in legal trouble <clears throat> by the grace of you know God or whatever it is I don't know and that's okay I don't have to know and um was domestic batteries you know literally fighting in yards and screaming and neighbors calling and um you know I mean just terrible, terrible relationship skills. And um, so anyway, to think that, I mean, I got a ring when I got proposed to, I got a ring and I had a wedding, an amazing wedding with my family and my friends. And, um, you know, my family planned that for me. Their, their baby that they chased around as a 12 year old, you know, jumping over fences in people's backyards and trying to, and, you know, the only way I survived was to be locked up in a facility. And so, um, you know, I was just thinking, uh, so, you know, one thing that when I was, you know, I started, I started college at 19. It was, uh, I'm going to get it together. I fall apart. I'm going to get it together. I'm going to fall apart. I'm going to, I'm going to do drinking, the, drinking and smoking and I fall apart, run into the hard stuff, you know, and fall apart. And so whenever, um, I got into recovery. I, I, I was like, I, I guess I'll try to figure out where I'm at with school because at that point I was like a 10 time or 10 year career student that had literally blown all my student loans to the max on my drug habits and everyone else's. And so they were like, Oh, you are, you're like basically done. All you need to do is do this last year and like you need to pick either this or this. And I was like, oh my gosh. And you know what's so crazy to me is that the whole time I went to school for 10 years, never did I understand that graduation was at the end of that tunnel. And for the first time, just from having my mind clear, just a little bit of like, I guess I just, I thought I was just going to school just to go to school. And they were like, you're about to have a degree. And so, um, I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology and classic Chelsea move. It's not, I didn't walk. I didn't do all that. I actually didn't even, uh, turn in my graduation papers to the next semester. So I actually, I think graduated technically in December, but then on, on my degree, it says I graduated the whatever, like May and, um, you know, we don't, we don't get better overnight. That's been years now. I'm actually about to go back to school um, to be a LPC um, in a master's program. And that was pretty cool because I had all these plans of, you know, going back to this place that I was going to work, that I got clean at. It's a, a psychiatric hospital. And um, that wasn't the plan. I ended up working underneath a therapist that ended up being freaking awesome. And I figured out that, Hey, I want to go get my master's and I want to sit on a couch and I want to help people from just sitting there and talking to them. And, um, you know, 
like, cause I, I had wondered, do I be a social worker? Do I, what do I do? Um, I was going back to going to be a nurse and I don't even want to be a nurse. And so it just goes to show you like that in my life is a, was a complete act of, it's a miracle I got with this lady and figured out. And what's crazy is it was Jimmy's old parole officer that ended up, uh, we ended up coming across each other like that. And so that was really cool. And, um, so uh, another cool thing that, so I played basketball in my life and man, like out of all the stuff that I could have said, like, I used to, oh, I, re I should regret so many things. And, you know, my regret was that I wasn't playing sports. So the other day somebody tagged me and wanted, or I'm not on Facebook. Thank God I can't do all that. But um, tagged Jimmy in a thing that said, tell Chelsea. And so I had officially on a basket, women's basketball team called the rusty buckets and i i mean i'm like i'm a rusty bucket like that's how you know that's how i'm a rusty bucket and you know like I, when i went there the other i'm still thinking about the basketball game i'm still thinking about it like i i figured out like i can do whatever i want like i got clean at 27 um 30 i don't even know about to be 36 now i can i i have a amazing i can do whatever i want I can go wherever I want. I can do whatever I want. I can, uh, my journey lately, and I know I've got one minute, is to work on, how do I put this? With, with I, I have a new sponsor. I don't know how I'm not gonna get a bunch into my specific program, but I, I was unhappy in recovery and I don't have to be. At some point I lost that and I like the only thing, the only thing that matters is that I like, I want, I'm, I want to be happy, joyous and free. Like, I don't want to be miserable every day. And so uh, with that, you know, I do my, you know, I wake up, I do the prayers that, you know, are particular to my liking, I um, have a mantra for the day. And I mean, I'm just like anyone else. I'll forget my mantra the second I walk out the door. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna start putting it in my pocket. You know, and this is me with eight years. You know, I had to switch it up. That's not happening. And, and in three years from now, I may need to switch it up again. You know, I, I don't know what that looks like, but I, you know, this is a working part of my life. And so um, I do my mantra at the end of the night, I do an inventory of my day. And when she told me, I was like, oh, whoa, so I'm actually going to do that. So, so people actually do do that, you know? And so that's been an amazing journey. Um, a lot of times it ends up being just straight gratitude lists, but sometimes um, when I figure out or realize that I'm not a perfect person and that I actually have resentments and uh, fears, then I, I write those down and I, um, believe it or not, usually uh, figure it out on that paper, on that paper that I um, have written at the end of the night. And, you know, and I read every night. Uh, that's part of um, what I was told to do. I'm one of those people that if, I mean, I would run around and stay on top of my head if, um, you know, that was what was going to keep me from putting a drink or drug in me because I am a raging um person when i am using i will um you know do all the things like i said i will kill myself with just about anything and i will kill myself sober i will do that and um thank god that you know i get to make the choice today to be happy and be free and be here with y'all and um I guess that's, I guess that's about all I got, y'all. Boom. Great job. I mean, tonight has been nothing but full of solutions. You know, I don't, you know, so glad to hear that talk. And uh, I was thinking as you're talking, you know, Jimmy must have a lot of missing socks, which is okay. You know, I, I understand what happened to him now, but that's all good. The, uh, our, our last speaker, I'm not going to say we saved the best for last, but I know we got a great one last. And uh, 
I think, and I know I met her fiance a couple weeks ago. So I, so you might be joining that couples club before it's over with and join in on our workshop. But I've been following Courtney now. Oh. I've almost been stalking her, you know, because anytime I get wind of an elected official, you know, I, I like to, you know, learn more and, and feed more information. And somewhere in the process, I felt like I had to educate Courtney. But then I realized I don't have to educate her. I need to learn from her because she knows more than I do. And uh, then I found out about the work you're doing up there in Augusta and what you're trying to do. And I know you couldn't come down here with Romeo when he was here a couple of weeks ago. But uh, we need to get you down here because you, you've heard from – several women who came through our program and, I th and we're very proud of our program okay. and we're really looking forward to helping you guys launch something up there or do some cross germination or whatever. But, uh, I can't tell you how much I really respect the space you're in and the work you do and where you're trying to go with all this. I mean, you, you certainly have my admiration. So, and I'm glad you've taken the time out. I know you're a busy woman. You sat through the whole presentation tonight, which is, you know, that's a big gold star there. And uh, don't let them boys come down here again and not bring you because you need to see this spot. And we'll take care of you once you get down. I almost told him, rent a car, man. Get a big car. We'll rent a car. Bring her down. But without any further ado, a nice warm welcome for Courtney Allen from Augusta, Maine. Oh, I think you did. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Honesty and John, for inviting me tonight and for everybody who's watching in. Um, as John mentioned, my name is Courtney Allen. I am a person in long-term recovery, and recovery has given me the privilege of serving my com recovery community um, as the policy director for the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project, or MERAP. It's also given me the privilege of serving my greater uh, Augusta community as an at-large city councilwoman um for the city of augusta and then it's also given me my most privileged role in society as a mother to my children um i began my recovery process when i was 22 years old i had no interest whatsoever in politics um or policy or anything to do with what i am doing today um actually quite the opposite i grew up in a small town in maine where everybody knew my name um I grew up in a family deeply affected by substance use and trauma and poverty. Um, no one ever knocked on my door when it was election season. Um, I don't think politicians ever came uh, around my neighborhood. And so how do you end up being an elected official coming from the background that I come from, right? And so what I can tell you about that is that it all started one day when my friend sent me a text message. Uh, his name is Andrew. He used to organize with the young people in recovery uh, here in Maine. He sent me a text message. I was a couple years uh, into my own recovery process. Um, and he had said, hey, Courtney, you wanna go testify at a public hearing? And I was like, what is a public hearing? I have no idea what you're talking about, uh, but sure. Um, because that's what recovery has taught me. It taught me to say yes, show up for my community and do the next right thing. So I w marched up to the state house with a couple of my friends and we testified on a bill um, to, to expand access to Narcan um, in, my, in my state. Uh, that bill didn't end up passing, but what more so what it did is it lit a fire inside of me that um, has brought me on this wonderful journey um, leading me up to today. Um, so I was in school at the time. I'm actually a seventh grade dropout. Um, I stopped attending school regularly in the seventh grade. I had my first son when I was 14. Um, I got my GED at 16 um, and my second son at 19. So I've, you know, I've taken a very non-traditional pathway um, to education, but I was in school at the time and I was becoming a drug and alcohol counselor. I knew that I wanted to help my community. I knew that I wanted to serve people uh, with active substance use disorder or folks in recovery. Um, what I didn't quite know yet was that the barriers our people face are so deeply ingrained to our systems of government. Um, but what I started to learn that in that first public hearing and through the process of walking through advocacy with my peers. And so I learned that 
if that my my calling in this world is I believe that my higher power has called me to help organize uh, the recovery community around policy solutions for um, directly impacted people and it coming straight from them, what they say they need, um, and then helping to lift their voices up to these spaces. So I changed my degree. Um, I recently graduated with a bachelor's degree in social justice. Um, I've gone on to my master's degree in public policy. I've had the honor and privilege of serving as uh, Senator King's intern uh, in the summer of 2020. I mean, the spring of 2020, right before COVID. I was there during the COVID uh, outbreak, the early COVID outbreak. I was on Capitol Hill uh, watching politicians not being able to shake hands is a little weird, uh, bumping, bumping arms as that went on. But anyway, so I came home uh, in the spring of 2020 and I ran for office. Um, my friend called me again, a different friend, and said, you know, Courtney, there's a seat open on the city council, and I think you can do it. And I so I said yes. Um, and I said, and it's it's been an amazing privilege uh, to serve my community in this way. You know, not only am I serving, you know, I, I think about stop signs and street lights and uh, how to build a new bridge and all of those things, but I've also had um, the opportunity to bring, uh, serve with my fellow city councilor, uh, Councilor Reagan Laura Shell, um, on the Substance Use Disorders Task Force. The mayor um, elect, mayor made this uh, task force for us um, to address some of these, some of these really keen issues that I see in my community. Uh, affecting people who are using drugs or who are in or seeking recovery. We don't have a re robust recovery support service network, uh, recovery um, treatment industry uh, in the city of Augusta. We're actually the capital. We don't even have our RCC um, in, our, in our city. So what we got to do over the last um, six months since I've been serving is that we took the uh, borrowed uh, young people in recoveries, recovery ready community model um, and sat down with elected myself and a few other elected officials, members in our communities, our city staff, and really dug into that about what can we do as a city of Augusta? Um, because I believe that every level of a government must respond um, mm -hmm. to the opiate crisis and other drugs if we're really going to make a, a, a sustained effort on um, lowering the numbers of overdoses and building recovery capital in our community. So we sat down with that eight pillars of recovery ready communities um, and applied it to our city. So one of the initiatives that have come out of that is we are looking to um, open what we are calling Project Recovery, um, which will be inside of our fire department if somebody wants to, is ready for recovery they will be allowed, they will be welcomed into our fire and ambulance department um, and we'll have somebody there, a project coordinator, probably a recovery coach. It's still kind of building out right now um, who will welcome them into our, into our um, community and help them access the services that they need, whether that's IOP or, you know, longer term treatment, hopefully a partnership with McShin. I want to send my folks to you, my my community member, as I see all the work that you're doing down in Virginia. You've helped many of my my Mainers, my constituents, um, my friends um, before. And so we applied for uh, direct funding, it's called now, from uh, the congressional offices at the House level, aka earmarks in the past, um, with Congressman Congresswoman Shelley Pingree she did approve our earmark uh, request. It's the first step in the process. We're honored and um, really looking forward and hopefully the appropriations committee at the at the federal level will fund our program. Um, and then we've also submitted to other our other Congress people at um, the federal level and hoping that will go through. Um, that's just one of the many initiatives that we've been able to come bring into uh, fruition. We've also been working on educating uh, my fellow council members. Um, a couple weeks ago, we did an arcane training um, at the council meeting. Um, all of my fellow council members got their own arcane and received training. Um, I think it might have been the first arcane training uh, given to council members in the state of Maine. Um, and so that's really cool. I know a few of them have uh, committed to keeping it 
on their persons in case they um, come across an accidental overdose in our community, they will be able to respond um, and know how to. And you know, like this girl grew up in a small town in Maine. Um, thankfully, due to recovery in my recovery community, gets to have an active voice in my community. Um, and so if there's anybody watching this who's like, you know, I think I might go do something crazy, like run for office. I think you should do it. Um, and I'm here to support you along the way. I have this like dream of just like training people up in recovery uh, to run for office. All these local city council boards, house seats, Senate seats, federal seats. Shout out to Ryan Hampton. Um, I want him to run. Um, so I don't know if I've used all my time, but I am forever grateful for the folks um, who met me where I was at uh, the day that I checked myself into detox. Um, that day, you know, maybe I'm gonna tell you a quick story to give you a little bit of background, right? So imagine this, my hands were shaking and my body was covered in scabs, ne orange needle caps lined the bathroom floor and my body hurt so badly that I could not change the broken light bulb in the bathroom. Outside the bathroom door, my children, Wyatt and Eamon, sat outside and said, Mom, Mommy, can you please just come out and play? I'd been in that bathroom for hours, and I could not leave it. I was broken, alone, and desperate. And the things that drugs and alcohol had caused me to do were not who I was ever expected to be. When I checked myself into detox that day, I was one of the lucky few who received access to a bed. I know almost to the bottom of my soul that if that had not happened, if I had been turned away from that bed that day, that I wouldn't be on this, on this Zoom call with you, I'd probably be dead like many of my friends. And so that is why I do the work that I do today, because somebody's life shouldn't be left to luck or chance or whether or not there's a bed at the detox. And we must expand access uh, to recovery support services across the continuum from harm reduction to abstinence-based recovery and everything in between. Because these are our community members, our friends, our children, and we must respond. We must respond in the same way that we've responded to the public health crisis of COVID-19, the AIDS crisis. And how we do that is by setting good, grounded in science, public health responses to the public health crisis that overdoses are. And so thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'm happy to walk with anybody through their process. Man, that's uh, very inspired, and, and that's exactly what Ryan wants to see happen nationwide is recovering folks. Get out there in the communities. Let's take our communities back and, and just get that criminal justice mindset, throw them away mindset, and flip them over to the healthcare mindset, and, and we end the impact addictions happening in our community. So, man, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of all of our speakers. So another fabulous care talks. Uh, like I said, I can't wait to get you down here and show you around. And uh, yeah, we're gonna make that happen. And uh, Chelsea, we're gonna get you up here in Richmond. Um, sorry, I've been on a diet lately, but we still, I still know where all the barbecue joints are. And uh, honestly, good job putting all this together as normal. Todd, uh, great job tonight, Todd. I. I, I I know you'll be leaving us soon and we're going to have somebody fill right in your shoes, but I'm not quite, he got some tall shoes to fill when that time gets here. And once again, don't forget our Memorial day picnic coming up on Monday, one to four, I think I heard. And uh, we got, we do one on 4th of July, Labor Day. And then we have a recovery fest coming on nine 11 falls on that day. So going to be a lot of activities, throughout the summer here in recovery. And you know, one thing, one of y'all said, I forget which one, but you know, we're the ones that's making 
recovery the epidemic okay recovery is cool the new high this is the high recovery high so and, and i can see another 10 15 years you know i can see a whole different world well you know I've, I've been in this space a long time almost 39 years 20 years in the, in the at the community level doing this work and it, it's percolating and uh, uh i think garrett was the one that said it, you know, five years downstream from advocates five years ago, helped them launch that Narcan program and whatnot. So, you know, I, I can pretty much play by play, seeing how it's been, see where we're at. And I got a little crystal ball. I think I know where we're going. But uh, another great night, folks. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. Honestly, closing words. Um, nothing. Just thank you very much. Thank you to all of our followers. And, um, you know, we're excited that these get to go into, we're in actually 48 jails, our videos. So um, hundreds of thousands of inmates have seen all of these. So thank you guy, your guys, because it's much bigger reach than just everyone that's watching right now. So we really appreciate helping those inmates and giving them a glimpse of hope. So that is amazing. Um, that's it. We're not going to have one in June. Uh, next care talks will probably be July taking a little break and focusing on some other stuff I need to do at McShin. So yeah, but everyone stay safe. Thank you, ladies. You're amazing. Courtney, I didn't even know a lot of your story until just now. And my son's name is Wyatt, too. I was like, oh, Wyatt. Um, but uh, you're you're a badass. Like, keep doing what you're doing. You're an amazing woman. Gosh, that's a, that's a amazing story. And, like, what you're doing now, I mean, you need to make a movie out of that for real. But, um but anyway, well, thank you, audience and Todd and everybody uh, for your time and energy and uh, for spreading hope tonight. So thank you very much. This is going to be the best day ever. This is going to be the best day ever. Wake up. Top of the morning. The bacon is crispy, the coffee is pouring. My meditation is peeling an orange. The bank says I'm already scoring. I got a parking spot right outside. Step into my brand new ride. All we ever get is green lights and blue skies. This is gonna be the best day ever. You got me looking so fresh. I can't get no better. Maybe I'm a team ready. Ready to rumble, ready to flex. I'm the king of the jungle. Up. I got a red fruit smoothie, James Brown bumping like I'm living in a movie. Look at me, I do the cha cha cha. Look at me, I sing na na na. Tippy tap tap like I'm Dick Van Dyke. Chim chim, I need you to be by my side. Spoonful of sugar gonna go with it. Oh baby, pass me the butter, gonna roll with this it. It's gonna be the best day ever. You got me looking so fresh.